thank you for taking time to be with me together today. Uh, I have a little passage that God's placed on my heart where Jesus is teaching a parable. And uh, I've entitled it, What Are You Seeking? As a pastor, it is a privilege to have a relationship with people in the church. And one of my favorite people, her husband has been in either a rehab facility or a hospital for about seven weeks. During this time when she couldn't have contact with him, she couldn't go to see him. And before, she's always been with him. They're a couple, they're in their 80s, and just a sweet, sweet couple, always encouraging and always together. And uh, so as she was struggling with this, and I was talking to her as her pastor and praying with her through the days, I asked her, I said, is there anything you need? She gave the Christian answer, pray. I was already doing that. I said, no, is there anything that you need? I said, do you need uh, someone to come over and just sit with you? and uh, or, or maybe a family member? And she said, no, Philip. And I said, you're okay? She said, yes. She said, during these times that I'm alone, I'll open my Bible and read it. And I'll talk to God. And he gives me peace. Wow. Her heart and God meeting her in her life. It was just a, a wonderful, wonderful picture of God and his love for her and them. And being with them as they go through this pandemic and all that it creates. Uh, I think it's an, it's an important thing to understand the heart of the matter. And she put everything in perspective as God meets with her. And I think Jesus is doing that in this parable that I want to share with you today. He's coming to the heart of the matter. This guy comes and asks him a question about the inheritance of the family. Questions that we hear. You know, I need more. Uh, is this right? And he was asking Jesus sort of as a civic judge to make a judgment. And Jesus cuts to the heart of the matter. And so I want to hear this text in light of our Savior as he speaks to his people. Let's pray together. Father, would you uh, bless your word to our hearts? Would you do what you say and give increase into our lives and situations? Um, help us, Lord, to hear and to heed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today I'm looking at uh, Luke chapter 12. Uh, and I want to read from a New Living Translation. It's sort of a thought for thought translation in uh, Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, Beware. Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story or a parable. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, What should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I sit, I'll sit back and say to myself, Eat, drink, and be merry. My friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Verse 20. But God said to him, You fool, you will die this night. Then you will get everything you worked for. Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. You know, one of the things that is, is true is that you can't have a relationship with God when the world, what you desire, money, or other things are above your relationship with God. There's a priority that, that God gives us. He says, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be taken care of. 
But this young man that comes, he's really just wanting God to mediate or judge between the situation that he has in his family. But Jesus immediately comes to the heart of the issue. He recognizes that it's more than just about the inheritance. It's about his desire. It's about what he has a heart from. He says in verse 15, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Now that word greed means a desire for more. Now more is a, is a term that's relative, which simply means that you want more and more and more and more and more. It's relative. Uh, you measure what you have and you want more. And that's greed, or the Old Testament word we're uh, familiar with is covet, or covetedness. Uh, you see this in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, the 10th commandment. He says, do not covet what your neighbor has, essentially. His wife, his land, his servants. You don't covet, you don't desire what other people have. And that's what he's talking about as he gives this parable. Be careful that you're not wanting more. I see this sometimes even in the church growth music movement that sort of become a part of the church. We want more and more and more. And bigger is better. <laughs> well, Jesus is teaching something contrary to that. And he is warning us against greed. Um, greed is like a cancer, but it's not a physical cancer. If you die a physical cancer, you're gonna get a brand new body if you're a born again believer. But if you have a spiritual cancer, you're not gonna get a born again body. You're gonna perhaps live in eternal damnation because you've missed the main thing of life. Uh, it, it's easy to do in a world where we evaluate everything by what we see, our science, or our own values. And Jesus is warning us to beware of that. Um, Tolstoy tells a story about a, a guy, and he entitles it, How Much Land Does a Man Need? And it's a story of a farmer who... Uh, was given the opportunity for a thousand rubies to walk around uh, as much land as he could in one day and then he would receive that land for a thousand rubies. Well, he started off, you can imagine, faster, as fast as he could. Then he started getting faster and he was going as far as he could, uh, but he had to be back to the starting point because if he wasn't back at the starting point, by the end of the day when the sun went down, then he wouldn't receive anything. The story goes on to say that he made such a large circle that by the end of the day, as the sun was setting, he began to run and push himself and run harder and run harder. And finally, indeed, he made it back right as the sun was setting. But he had given so much to that endeavor to make it large and more that he died. His servants put him in a grave six by three feet and then told Stoy, how much land does a man need? And if we're not careful, what we covet, what we desire, the greed within us causes us to want more and more. And Jesus is warning against that. Listen to what he says in this text. And it's, it's really funny. You can tell the guy in the parable had been seduced by this idea. Listen to what he says, beginning in verse 16. Jesus replied, friend, who made you a judge to decide such things as that? Verse 16, I'm sorry. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm which produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Now one of the deceitful things about greed is this. He thought if he had more, then finally he could relax. Not that his barns were full now, but that he needed more. Then he could eat, 
drink and be merry. And that's what greed does. It says, man, if I only had that, if I only had that, and it, and it causes us to strive or desire or to seek after those things. And the next thing you know, we're captured by our greed. And we often do not see it. We justify the American dream and, and say that anybody could make it. And that is true. The Bible says that if you don't work, that you shouldn't eat. That's not what we're talking about here. You should work. You should work hard. You should do your best uh, as unto the Lord, whatever you do, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do. But this is talking about a desire for more, a desire for bigger, a desire for better. Uh, instead of being satisfied with where God's placed you, we desire more. Or Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. He says, what do you have that you haven't been given? And if it's been given to you, why do you boast? Because indeed, all we have, our gifts, our abilities, our strength, our breath that we just breathed, it all comes from God. He provides for us. Everything that we have, He's given to us. I was talking to somebody um, and they were talking about their tithe. And, you know, uh, they had obviously not been giving. They were giving their tithe in other places and things that they wanted to do. And, and you see this quite often. Uh, some people even steal from God because of they think they're meeting their needs. But God says, give first your first fruits to Him. Honor Him with your wealth, and He'll take care of everything else. But because we don't believe that, then we hoard our wealth, and we want more, and we do whatever it takes, whether it be stealing from God or whatever it takes, cheating our neighbor or uh, per, uh, saying something's a lot better than it is. It's a form of greed. It's a form of covetousness, and it will not satisfy you. As a matter of fact, greed can never be satisfied because it always wants more. And so it's important for us to understand. I like the way Augustine said this, and I think he said it very well. He said this. He said, sin comes when we take a perfect natural desire or longing or ambition and try desperately to fulfill it without God. Not only is it sin, it is a perverse distortion of the image of the Creator in us. All these things, these good things, all our security are rightly found only in our Lord. And to take sex you see this often where instead of a, a man and a woman enjoying themselves they begin to look outside and entice through uh, sexual desires the same thing with money uh, some folks steal from god because they want that money so badly and so anything that is good can be distorted if it's taken without god the heart of the matter here is greed. Not only is it the tenth commandment, but it's something that lures us into living without a rich relationship with God. And that's ultimately what he says here. Listen to verses 20 and 21. I'm going to leave this with you. It's not something I can measure for you. Maybe you're listening today and say, well, I'm not that way. I'm not that way. But look at your life. Look at what you spend your time doing. And figure out where is God in that? He says it this way in verse 20 and 21 in the New Living Translation. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night, then you will get everything you worked for. Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. You know, God sort of laid this text on my heart last week and and I've really thought about it in light of my own life. <laughs> what do I desire? What am I looking for? Am I looking for something without God in it? Man, I want to encourage you today. Jesus' message, according to Matthew, the apostle was given to us in Matthew 4.17. It says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And we've almost made repent a four-letter word. And all it merely means is to, to turn back to God. 
And when we hear God's word, it's not meant to make us feel bad or that we're not doing right. It's meant to reconcile us, to call us back into our relationship that is right with God, that is rich with him. <laughs> this guy, you know, I, we're not told in the text what it is, but I believe that he heard that message and he realized that he wasn't where he needed to be. That he repented and placed his faith back in God to moderate this mess that he had in his family as they were worried about their inheritance. What about you? What is God saying to you today? Have you ever thought that maybe God gave this message exactly for me and for you? Place your faith in God. Have a rich relationship with Him and all that entails. He loves you. He made you. And He's made a way for you to come to Him. Repent. Or perhaps uh, you're in a place that, that you've gotten off track, that God's no longer first in your life. He's, he's a part of your life, but he's no longer first. The answer's the same. Repent. Return to the Lord who loves you and has made a way for, him, for you. Don't master on the things of this earth, but of the things to come. May God richly bless you in your relationship with him. God bless you.